Ready? I'm going to introduce you on stage and then I'll hand the mic off to you and we'll be good to go. <coughs> Great. Hello and welcome to Politicon. We're so glad to see so many of you out here in support of such an important conversation and topic today. Now, without further ado, please welcome the moderator of the Muslims for Progressive Values, Radicals, Refugees, and Republicans panel, singer, songwriter, producer, and founder of Muslims for Progressive Values, Ani Zonneveld. Hi. Welcome. Uh, my name is Ani, and um, I'm really excited to be hosting this panel here at Politicon. I'm a big fan of Politicon.com. Um, the title of the, the, the panel today is Radical Refugees and Republicans. And just a quick uh, rundown background of the, the title is that we wanted to address the issue of refugees given the policy the, um, of, the, of the Trump administration and the unfortunate linking of refugees with radicalism. And just sort of to get the audience that we wanted, we threw in the word the other R, Republican, in there. So um, my first question to you all is, uh, with a show of hands, how many of you are Republicans? OK, a good amount, but not enough. <laughs> But anyway, so I'm going to go down um, the list here, our panelists, um, and introduce you to them, and then we'll get straight into the discussion. Um, he's a Fox News senior correspondent who covered the Iraq War from the Middle East and who was one of the first on site during the San Bernardino attack, Adam Housley. Raise, raise your hand. Right there. Raise your hand. Raise your Adam. hand. <laughs> TV host, author, and sat satirist called John, the John Stewart of the Middle East, Egyptian expat, and Time Magazine pioneer, Bassem Yusuf. And, and, and I should add a, a, um, a new child, a, a new dad as well, as of yesterday. Um, <laughs> Bassem. Bassem, it's not your show. <laughs> <laughs> Turkish race, social media sensation, BuzzFeed contributor and host of the Young Turks, the Breakdown segment and the Pop Trigger entertainment channel, Hassan Piker. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. International, there are some who don't like you. international <laughs> counter trafficking advisor and traumatologist specializing in survivors of human trafficking, radicalized youth, war, refugees, terrorism, and violence, Dr. Hale Sadir Sadeh. <laughs> 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 
And to my left, Bon Villian, actor, musician, and cultural critic Robert Davi. So, um, right, getting right into it, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do definitions. Sometimes we talk a lot about what refugees are and what immigrants are, but we actually don't know what those um, technical definitions are. So we're going to go to the expert here on the panel with Dr. Ale to do the definitions. So you've all been hearing a lot about refugees in the media, and refugees are individuals who've been forced to leave their countries due to persecution, war, and mass violence, whereas immigrants are individuals who've chosen to resettle in a designated country. So that will kind of cover the span of our discussion to operationalize those terms for everyone today. So. Well, economic migrants, similar to immigrants, um, in many respects, have to resettle to a specific country or designated area due to uh, inability to find work and survive, however, are not facing the same severity as refugees. So just to recap again, one more time, refugees, because that's what we're focusing on today and yes, not the rest of it. But the focus of our, our discussion are refugees who have been forced to leave their countries due to war, mass violence, and persecution. So moving forward, what we're going to do is, we're gonna, I'd like to take the perspective of the issue of fear. There's a lot of fear um, on the issue of refugees. There's a ban on refugees entering the United States for 120 days based on President Tr uh, Trump's executive order. So that's, that's fine, I understand. So let's address the fear factor, um, the issue of security of, of, of America. I'm an American first, I just so happen to be Muslim, okay? So, so let's get that straight. Just because I'm Muslim doesn't mean that I'm any less concerned about American security. Got it? <laughs> so, um, Robert, what is your perspective on the issue of refugees and the issue of security in America? And how can we be both compassionate? Or should we? To what extent should we um, welcome refugees? I just want to go down the panel um, just to get your perspectives on this. Well, my perspective is one of uh, common sense, compassion, and safety, and awareness. Um, and there's a variety of, uh, of elements that go into the whole issue that, unfortunately, in the news bites, you don't get a, an in-depth understanding of a lot of it. The ban is a temporary ban. It's because not only the immigration system is broken, and the vetting process is broken in terms of who's coming into our nation. From certain countries, that's no secret. It makes sense to me that when there's a massive amount of people moving from one part of the world to another, and that part of the world has a radicalized element that wants to see certain harm to other elements, other countries, I mean, in Egypt, there was a gentleman named Saeed Kitab in the 60s who wrote a book called In the Shade of the Quran. Uh, he was educated in the United States in the 50s, went to Egypt, taught in the universities, was arrested. He's kind of the father philosopher of Al-Qaeda, the Muslim Brotherhood, and he is the one that said, death to Christians, Jews, and the West. This is since the 60s. He wrote a book, he took Mein Kampf, and he wrote this equivalent, the Arabic equivalent, called In the Shade of the Quran. Understanding that this, there's a cultural movement or a, a political movement, ideology, that has infected Islam. And I had the first Islamic conference last year at Politicon. What is Islam in the 21st century? I asked them and I had some Sufis and some other uh, Islamic to understand because there's so many different sects of Islam within Islam. But in terms of refugee and in terms of understanding the, the threat that could be infiltrated, it takes one two, three, and then I'm saying you don't have a compassion, but the system is broken. It'd be like the system here being broken when you had to come in through a uh, detector. Did you guys have to come in through a detector? Hell now, yeah. All right, me. Right, look at my little face. I had to go through a detector. But, but what happens is, if that was broken down, all our safety, it would take one person to hurt the safety of, our, uh, of this room. So that's, in terms of, the, I think it's a common sense approach now. It's a temporary ban until that gets fixed, and then you can 
let more people in. Also, what was stirring to me, and I did do it, I was in Estonia recently, I did a concert there. And I met the Barbara Walters of Estonia. She was a female journalist. And another female journalist wrote a book early on called The Force of Reason, Oriana Falaci, who was a very left-wing journalist, but wrote the book called The Force of Reason, and she coined the term Eurabia. <clears throat> she was the first one. Now, this journalist I met was very pro-refugee, and then she went to Budapest and did a documentary. And the influx of refugees and the danger of all of that, I understand, but the, the danger of it is the lack of assimilation and the anger. Now, I'm saying that all refugees are radicalized, but there is a displacement and a disproportionate displacement. And when you let so many people in, I think the better idea was to create a beautiful safe zone. It was always stunning to me that in Israel that the Gaza Strip didn't look like Disneyland. With all the money, I went to Jordan in 1994, met with King Hussein, the father. And I said, you know, with all the Arab money, why don't you guys let the Gaza Strip instead of, and I played a Palestinian, because right, being just bombed. so you know, 1988. Um, but why isn't the Gaza Strip, why couldn't it be built up like a, a certain kind of, uh, anyway, I'm, I'm yeah. varying from yeah, the Robert. subject. Yeah, Robert. Uh, okay, um, Go ahead. Your, your turn will come, Bessem. Um, Dr. Halley. You might want to talk about also, sorry, you want to talk, let them, okay, Adam? I mean, as, as, a, as a journalist who's been and seen a lot of these areas um, for work, um, I will say that putting politics aside, because that's what my job is to do, and there is no more compassionate people or country in this world than America, despite all of our faults and flaws, and we have a lot of them. There's no doubt. When we, I'll give you an example. When I was in Thailand, we were one of the first people on the ground there. Horrific scenes. I heard back in the States from my family when I had a chance to call back, because we were working crazy hours, that there was a lot of criticism over the money that was pledged. Money pledged and boots on the ground are two different things. And the fact is, when I've been to Haiti or wherever it happens to be, and I'm not saying we always do good. I'm going to put the war, zone, the war situation aside, talk just about refugee situations. Um, we are the first, usually, on the ground with boots doing work. Hands down, no doubt. American military members and NGOs and also regular citizens. I saw, I met Americans of all walks of life, all colors. They came from Australia on vacation, uh, other parts of Asia that flew to Thailand to help. Other countries do amazing stuff too, not discounting any of their work. But fact is, there is no doubt that we do the most, primarily because of our size and our money. Having said that, the problem with refugees in this country right now and with, with radicalism and with the issue of what's happening uh, in North Africa and the Middle East is that everything has been politicized. Right away we get into this now where people, the <laughs> first thing you say is, well, if you're for the ban, then you're racist. If you're against the ban, then you're an idiot. And no one ever actually looks at the depth of both arguments, which in a lot of cases, we all want the same thing. In this room, we can all sit down, and I guarantee you, we're probably going to agree on 90% of everything, at least maybe more, Democrats, Republicans included. But we always focus on the 9 to 10% we don't agree on. So how are you going to build a bridge when you start in the middle of the valley? So you've got to start on the ends and come to that bridge. We can get to those disagreements. We can work through them, but we never do. And this, is, this topic actually is one of the most clear topics in the country that shows that divide that we are probably are going to agree on 90% of this, and then we can focus on the 10. We go backwards. I appreciate that, Adam. I really do. Um, I think it, there, we, there is a lot that we can uh, do together as Americans, and that's why I think that we should be we should be resolving a lot of the issues, the divide that we have. A lot of it is um, sort of fake, actually. I think that we have a lot more in common than we. Uh, you that, can hear so it next door. Do. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm serious. No disrespect to what's happening next door. I, I watched a little bit of the, of, of the debate between Tommy and I forgot the other girl's name. I'm sorry. So, thank you. I, knew, I know her. I met him. I met him both. Um, but notice respect. I love the energy. It's great to have people that are invested in what they believe in. But that is that helping? I don't know. You guys might be able to answer. In my, I'm coming from the news world, so I say no. Um, Bassam? Yeah. Your turn. What's your, your Hi. perspective uh, on this? So on the since I just got my baby, which is my anchor baby here now, so <laughs> kind of... Oh, uh, his name is Adam, 
And, uh, the, and the reason it's a TSA friendly name, uh, <laughs> which is uh, we, we had actually to go through a lot of process because my first choice was Ali, the second choice was Hassan, and I cannot name him because I'm going to give him a life of hell in airports all his life. So the only name that does not, does not get like changed from between Arabic and English was Adam, which is it, very interesting that like. I have to think about that while just doing a very simple task like naming my also, son. Also, it's a Jewish name too, so it works. It's an, it's a, he is like, he is the name. I mean, he, he was the father of all of us. So, uh, which actually brings me to the topic of what, one of the things that you said in the beginning, which is fear. I mean, listen, he, I agree with you. Yes, 90% of the stuff we agree upon. But it's the 9 or 10% that's actually hurting a lot of people. Uh, there, when you, when every time you hear refugees, but they're radicalized, there are uh, people that we have to compassion, but some of them can kill us. You actually can lead to a narrative that you're going to be afraid of anybody who looks different than you. And this is why there were like three Indians, Indian Sikhs, who are neither Muslim, neither refugees, neither from the Middle East, got killed, on, uh, they got shot. This is the kind of narrative that I'm worried about. The refugees, I mean, it is only the, the surface of the problem. When I was in the, uh, covering the, R, the RNC, all I heard for three days is illegal immigrants and radical terrorist Islamists. And of course, like, we don't mean all immigrants. We don't mean all Islamists or all Muslims. We just need, mean the radical and we mean the uh, illegal. But as you listen to it for three days, all you listen to is or you hear is immigrants and Muslims. So this is the problem that we're having. You have people here, who, like I was interviewing people who thought that Obama is overseeing training camps outside of New York for ISIS that's operatives. Not, that's not the majority of the country. Well, well this, that's not the majority of the country, but it, this came from somewhere. Some people who think there are training camps, and some people who think that anybody who looks brown, who is a Muslim, he's a danger. But there are. So, so the thing is, like, and I'm talking, sir, about like, I'm not talking about this. I'm talking about Fox News. I'm talking about Infowars. No, it's not. Fox, I'm, don't I'm, the Fox I'm, News I'm crap. We're not going to go there. We, We're not going to we go are, there. You are talking because about, that's You are talking about like. I mean, it's called. No, you're, listen. You're talking about. The problem is you're this. You're talking about an. This is the problem. I don't. You're talking. You're talking about a narrative of fear that's making everybody worried about these people coming from overseas. People, those people actually have fled war-torn uh, countries, and they're and actually... we're partially they, responsible they, for... I mean, like, yeah, I mean, like, I mean, of course you can... Yeah, we can... Actually, yeah, there's some can. truth in that. Okay. Yeah, you are possible. But, like, the thing is, I'm worried about the fear. I'm worried about people who are neither immigrants, okay. neither refugees, neither they had to go through the sea to actually to come here, people who might be legal citizens here who would be affected by this kind of fear. Right. It doesn't stop at refugees. It doesn't stop at Muslims. There are people, as a matter of fact, after 9-11, the first victim of a hate crime from people who were very angry at, at Muslims after 9-11 was a Christian Egyptian cop who was running a convenience store in New York because we look like each other. Right. We look the same. So this is, this is my worry. It's the narrative of fear. Hassan? So we talk about the divide and we talk about fear-mongering against Muslims and then we have a president in the White House right now that essentially made a name for himself in the political discourse space by uh, this lie that Obama was actually not an American citizen. And a lot of, poli a lot of people believe that narrative. So when you, uh, and it goes to that same concept of the Muslim ban is, is far too overreaching and not, not even solving a single aspect of the problem. Because if you look at the first, uh, even when we talk at this panel, like when you look at the introduction of this panel, this is the clash of uh, the warfare among civilizations. Islam is the other, Islam versus, uh, versus Western civilizations. Like when you look at Donald Trump's uh, speech in Poland, this is all a part of the Steve Bannon manifesto. If you look a little bit deeper into Steve Bannon's manifesto, you'll realize that, that he is trying to portray the world as Western civilizations versus Islam. That is a terrifying narrative when considering the fact that the 33% of the world's population are Muslim. Where, are like, how, are, how will we solve that problem? Why are you denying what I just said about Saeed Kitab, who took Mein Kampf, and made in the shade of the Quran. Nobody is denying okay, that. Okay, David sir. Duke yeah. lives amongst us. David Duke is an American. Sir, 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 sir. 
We not, as a matter of fact, Said Qutb, let me actually, Said Qutb was a Muslim Brotherhood leader. Yes. He came in and he helped radicalize yes. the thought of Muslim. Do you see anybody here who's no, a pro-Muslim saying, Brotherhood? Just, no, he mentioned Steve Bannon's dictic, West against, no, we never started West against Islam. It's not about who started. It wasn't sir, that. Yes, yes, but like Said Qutb is a guy, a radical, a fringe, and he was not an advisor to a president. Okay, wait. So is Karl pause, Marx. Pause, pause, yeah. pause, pause. So is Karl Marx. Um, Dr. Halle. I have a question for the audience. So I wanted to share something with you. Kindly entertain this. Tell me what, you, what your thoughts are. Often when, you know, I treat a lot of victims of human trafficking and gender-based violence and rape and these horrific things that have ex- they have experienced, um, people often blame them for it. You know, it's a psychosexual issue, brings up a lot of shame, and they call this fundamental attribution error in social psychology. It's a defense mechanism. So could this be a defense mechanism, potentially? Um, Our irrational fear of peoples who have suffered an immense amount of trauma, torture, violence, and when given the opportunity to resettle and have homeostasis and have what we have thrive and are incredibly resilient. And so I ask you and I appeal to your compassion as people. Is that, is, could this potentially be a defense mechanism? What is the rationale since 2001, ever, any and every refugee we've ever resettled have a successful terrorist attack on American soil harming Americans? No. Syrians? No. Not successfully so. And the percentage, that, sm- that model minority doesn't always, does not reflect the whole. So the irrationality, again, the defense mechanism that this represents is disuniting us. And our discourse around it, this is the issue. Fear and trauma is being weaponized. So the very thing, the very rhetoric that, that instigates this Dr. dialogue Dr. Halle, one second, and is the one source second. of the Dr. Halle, fear one second. is being weaponized. And the children I see in my office who've been quote-unquote recruited from all sorts of domestic terrorist organizations and a few foreign, foreign terrorist organizations as well, bullying, trauma, alienation, that is what perpetuates this. So I have a, I have a question for you. How do you think we can disrupt this and do you see this as a defense mechanism, as an, as an irrational fear? So I, I'd like to, you person in the back, you need to shut up because... Um, because you're actually being rude because we are trying to have a conversation. If you don't want to have a conversation, then please leave because there's a lot of others that do want to have a conversation about it. But is this, is so, it conservatives talk a big game but about this free an, speech until it's speech that they don't like. If you're so goddamn triggered, you can see yourself the fuck out. This, oh, this, this is exactly what I was talking about in my intro. The back and forth, no disrespect to you, I I understand where you're coming from, I understand why you feel that way, but I'm telling you that the majority in this country don't feel that way, and that if we're going to find that 9 or 10 percent, whatever the percentage is, it's not scientific, then the rest of us have to come together, and then we can focus on that. And I understand why you want that person to leave, but the way I handle it is, we need to go at this in a way where we're all on the same page, hold on, as one, and go, hey, dude, seriously, let it go or go, rather than yelling and screaming and saying the guy's an idiot shut up. That's the problem we have right now. Because if, listen, my wife is, the only reason I mention this is my wife is black, I'm white, she happens to be in Hollywood. Anybody who follows us knows that we're attacked because everybody thinks I work for Fox News and I love Donald Trump. I didn't vote for either one of them. God's honest truth. The point is, it doesn't matter if I did, because it's my right. So my point is, if we're going to go further in this panel and on this, in this tape, we've all got to at least respect the fact that each of us have an opinion and it may be different, and so long as it doesn't hurt you, then we should be able to talk about it. Otherwise, we're never going to solve anything. Thank you. Uh, Wait, I, one second, one second. I, one second, one second. Let me say something. I want to go back to the issue of safe zone, Adam. And I really appreciate you saying that, and also the gen- gen- generosity of America. That is no... Hands down, America is the most generous nation in the world. On the issue of safe zone... On the issue of safe zone, one thing that 
there was a, the, a refugee that just got off the boat off the, uh, one of the islands of Greece, and there was a media that the media reporter that went microphone straight into his face, getting off the boat. You, you're from Syria. What do you think could have been done differently to save Syria? And this guy, he's a, he was a doctor. He says, you know what? I don't want to be a refugee. I don't want to be on that boat. I don't want to leave Syria. But I had to because there was no safe zone created. We were being bombarded every single day by Saad, uh, by da- Daesh, by American allies. So it's for some people, what you have to understand is the trauma that Dr. Um, Hale alluded to. It's not just that. It's that they don't want to be refugees. And I think we also have to flip that table. We have to try to understand it from their perspective, not just from our perspective. I just hope that when we leave this room today is that I really appeal that we do listen to each other. We do, as Americans, we seriously do need to listen to each other respectfully. And the interruption is just is escalating the hostility that we don't need. Please. May I pick up this? Yes, Here's a please. Thing I don't on immigration for a second, because and, and the migrants. The Italian-American, I'm Italian-American. My grandparents came from Sicily and Naples. In 1886, there were more lynchings of Italians than blacks, than any other race. 1906, the New York Times said, the Italian is dirtier and lower than the Negro. That's just a common fact. Italians were changing their last names because we were, I'm from Sicily, the Arabic influence, everything else. We were looked at as second class, third class, fourth class, scum of the earth citizens. But the Italian American, there was something that didn't have that aspect to it that has to be addressed in terms of the radicalization. And I'm not saying, I've been to the Middle East, how welcoming it is in the, in the countries. I've been to Turkey. Unbelievable. Uh, Jordan. I mean, the, 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 the uh, support and the, the, the uh, acceptance of Americans. Hospitality. The hospitality. But there is a certain element of, the, of that. And that's where the, uh, uh, the, the mindset is. And it, it is not, it's not bad of Americans to be cautious, to have the compassion, of course, of the refugee plight and understand that uh, people, children are being affected uh, 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 by... And young kids, because when you're seeing something and you're seeing a certain group of people, because I saw it as a kid, as an Italian, you know what I mean? The Guinea, they go wapo. I understood that feeling. But at the same time, we did, as you are doing, as we're having by discovery or by conversations, the acceptance in the community say, we're safe here, we're Americans now. The problem is, when I went to London and the police tell me, don't go there because it's under Sharia jurisdiction. But, but that's true. But, but that's true. But, but we see, you can shake your head, it's not true. But it is true. It, it is, happens. It is true. <laughs> it, 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 it is, is true. true. Don't go there, it's under Sharia jurisdiction. What, 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 what does that say about the assimilation and the ability to assimilate? America is only afraid, America is only concerned of the inability of Islam to assimilate into our culture. And, and that's what I'm saying. That's they're not going to say it because it's politically incorrect or they don't want to be. But that's really the basis of it all. How do we get through that? I had that conference in terms of history. All right. Can, can, sir, sir, I'm very glad that you brought up the part about Italians being treated as second-class citizens, which is like more than 100 years ago. Since then, we have evolved. But and, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, it's just, but the thing is, and we have evolved enough to know that we should not do that to other human beings. So that's one thing. The second thing, let's talk, let's talk since we all love statistics, let's talk about Muslims in America. Muslims here in America are the second most educated subgroup after Jewish people here. They are, Muslim women are more likely to go have higher education than Muslim men, and, they're more, and, more, and more likely to, to have a professional job. Third, 57%, do, uh, do, uh, according to a Pew Research, 57% of Muslims here in America believe there is more than one interpretation to Islam. Now, I will agree with you that there is a virus, there is a radicalization of the mainstream Islam. Nobody is here is denying it, but a lot of people are fighting that. And most of the people who are fighting that, people who have left the Islamic world, who are still fighting it back. Now, those people who are fighting that kind of radicalization, they are persecuted. They are not mostly persecuted by the Ayatollah. They are persecuted by the secular military regimes who are supported by the Western, Western administrations in Europe and in America. It's been all going all that because somebody told them it's better to go with a, a secular and they're not secular. 
secular military dictator than going with a radicalized Islamic government. Both of them are worse than each other. It's horrible. Both of them are two sides of the same coin. So the thing is, when, and, I, and I understand the, the gentleman in the back who said, like, it's the problem with Islam. You know what? Islam has a lot of stuff that can scare you, but so does the Bible, so does the, the, the Old Testament. But the thing, the, the thing is, Christianity did not evolve. It was Christian societies that evolved. And this is what we want to, what, that what we're fighting for. There was one for Muslim, message. For, for Muslim societies to evolve. And Muslims cannot evolve. And Muslims cannot evolve. A Muslim. No, sir, 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 sir. No, no, no I, I did not finish my point. I did not finish my Come, point. Let's sir, let people speak. Calm down. Christianity did not go through Reformation. It is the interpretation that went through Reformation because it's the same Bible. The same, then the same Quran existed in the 50s and 60s where hijabs in Egypt was considered as an anomaly. Something happened in the last 40 years. It was radicalized by the Wahhabism and by the, the Saudi money who actually been infused. Yeah. And by the way, so you can try to get people from the Westboro Church, give them a country of their own, give them oil, give them weapon, give them money, and let's see how Christianity would evolve. So the thing is, so the, and the thing is, it's the same Saudi Arabia has, is actually, which is the biggest ally of the United States. And when King Abdullah died last year, every single American official, present, past, and future, went there, hurried to his funeral. So there's a little bit of hypocrisy Even there. Donald Trump, who consistently criticized Hillary Clinton. He went for, there for $110 billion yeah, of weapon deals. He okay. gave more money to Saudi Arabia than Barack Obama did so that Saudi Arabia could con constantly bomb Yemen just like we do so that s children in Yemen are terrified when the skies are clear because that means that there could be a drone strike at any given moment. It's 2017 that is the reality and we that they live in, in the uh, Middle East. Pass them one at a time, please. Sorry. Sorry. That, that is the reality that they live in the Middle East. And then we bomb their countries. We systemically destroy any sort of hope that they may have for uh, building a democratic institution, and when they run away from those wars that we've caused, for the most part, then we deny them entry, and then we act like they are the radical ones? How is that compassionate? So, I just want to... Adam, Adam, Adam. You got... They're, they're on to something, and I'm going to try to bring it back a little more towards the middle, um, in the sense that the, the U.S., the reason why we're talking about refugees coming from Syria is partly because of U.S. policy. So we're, we're talking about what's happened and why they're coming here. Part of it is because Islam is dealing with an issue that um, most people that I know in the Middle East, when I've been there, and even though my friends here in America will, will agree with. Um, but there's a second part of it, so it's not just an internal battle, which we'll get to, but it's also the external issues. And, and it goes to what you guys are talking about in the sense that we should care why the war in Syria started. We should understand that the last administration, it hasn't been really reported, and don't get me wrong, all of our foreign policy, in the, not just this administration, the last one, President Bush, President Clinton, they've all followed the same line with being beholden to the Saudis. We did ship weapons into Jordan, just like we shipped weapons into Libya. The reason why, I'm, and there, there's no easy answer, that's the thing here. The, the answer, I think, the problem is we've there had... There is an easy answer. No, there is. Destroy the military industrial complex that is one of the only industries in America. That's Adam, why in reality, going into constant... Hassan, in that doesn't, point is, that my doesn't, point is, that my doesn't point help is, the in conversation. Reality, we can we consider talk about the military industrial complex until the, until the cows go home. In, 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 and I'm not saying that doesn't exist. I'm not going back to Eisenhower and all the comments he... Let's go strictly to the fact of this. You had thugs in charge of those countries. You had a different foreign policy perspectives that the thought that the take, to take those thugs out and put in a different way of leadership a was a good idea. For America. And I'm not saying it was a good idea. I'm telling you it was a bad idea. Yeah. We put our fingers in places all the time and cause problems. The issue is that is where this all started when it comes to the external issues. Then we have to go to the internal ones, which you're talking about, which I think we have to bring it back to because we consider and talk about it, the U.S. mistakes, the European mistakes, how Israel was drawn wrong. I mean, we can consider we can bring up every topic you want to bring up. Irrespective of all the mistakes. Right. And he brought up a point before in terms of, and I think this is because I'm solution-based. I want solutions. And this has been an issue that, as I said, in 1988 I played a Palestinian. Alan Dershowitz was the technical advisor on the movie I did, Terrorist on Trial, the United States of America versus Salim Ajami. The reason why I say this is because I had a deep understanding of what was going on in the world back in 1888, having to research the philosophies that I did not understand. 
and I had an empathy for it by playing the character. My question is, in Catholicism we have a pope. The Catholic Church, if there were people in the Catholic Church, and they do this periodically, and this, there's one person that can say this is wrong. We don't have that in Islam. My thing was, and I've been asking this for years, the last couple of years, why can't, why are not the Islamic community, and maybe it does, I think it needs to get together to have a, a conference in terms of defining Islam in the 21st century. That's the solution of what's so necessary. Sir, these conference, no, 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 these has, conferences are happening all the time, Hassan, but you're not following Hassan, them. No, but they should have not something that we should, okay. it should be, it should be like huge. All right, uh, right, right I want to actually like answer this. No, after, no, later. I want to answer That's that. Ali. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. I just wanted to pose that question again. What is something that's in our control? Is our perception, our language, and our attitude towards this? And to engage that, engage you. What, is, what can you walk away doing from this dialogue? Have you spoken to refugee families before? Have you met them? I am almost positive. If you spent 25, 30 minutes, and your perception was the counter, it would change. They're no different than you. Um, I find. Again, it's a strange, irrational fear. It's like fearing the person next to you. They're people. And let's bring it back down to the core of the issue, something you have control over. OK, I have, again, um, I don't appreciate rudeness. Um, I let you want to say something about the, uh, the application process for becoming a refugee. We had a Syrian uh, member of our progressive Muslim community for about two plus years, and he applied for a refugee status here in the United States for two years, and he did not get it. And he was actually tortured in Assad's prison system for helping women who were demonstrating in the earlier part of the um, revolution process when it was still peaceful in the first year. And he was providing food and shelter and because of that he was being jailed and tortured. So what he did then, he gave up, he was very delusional with the process here in the United States and he applied to Belgium. And within 12 weeks he received his refugee status in Belgium. So he moved there, brought his family there to Belgium. This is to say that in the United States, we have actually a really stringent process in place. It is not easy to even secure a refugee process, uh, status. So when we talk about refugees and how there is not a mechanism in place, that exception is not true. That is actually a political narrative that, yes. that is actually false. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but the issue is consistent. I think the people in this room need to know the issue with our refugee policy and all our immigration policies, we don't have consistency. Anybody who knows anybody from Mexico who's illegal, I grew up in California, my best friend became legal two years ago, one of my best friends. And there's just no consistency. And I think what the problem is, if someone tries to come out and say consistency, they generally are someone who supports the current president, and that becomes an attack. And if you're against consistency, you hate the current president. Again, we have to go back to define a common ground. So wanting consistency does not mean keeping Muslims out. It does not mean disliking somebody because of the color of their skin. And I'm not saying this current policy is correct. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying we've got to have a consistent policy, which we haven't had this administration, the last administration, go back as long as you want to go. We haven't we had have. consistency. Have so I have a question. Policy. Hang on, uh, Hassan. I have a, a question. Yeah, what, is there anybody in the audience here who is a refugee or who has a family who was a refugee? I would like to get a microphone to this person. If you are a refugee, in the last, uh, that was your process here in the United States in the last few years. Please put your hands up. Can we get a microphone to this person, yeah, it'd be nice please? To see. If you would like to speak, we would love to. Would hear you me. like to? Sorry, can, can, first, can I see the hands? Show of hands, way up, I so I can see. Okay, the question was: anybody here in the audience who came to the United States as a refugee himself, herself? Okay, I'm going to give this gentleman up front here. A microphone, please. Could you stand up? Yeah. If he, if he wants to speak. <laughs> just, just coming right up. Hello. Hi. What's your name? My name is Emil Roy Toppel. Okay. Speak clearly into the microphone so we can hear you properly. Sorry about that. I've never used one of these before. <laughs> uh, yeah, my name Don't is... Don't do it. Too close? My name is Emil Roy Tobel, and I'm a refugee, came to America about 20 years ago. 
From where? Uh, Moldova, former Soviet Republic. All right. So what's your story? Um, from what I understand, my parents experienced a lot of persecution back in Moldova for being Jewish. My dad specifically um, is Jewish. Uh, they gave a lot of stories how my dad had to like get a driver's license, like to take the test like three times, and they failed him twice just for being Jewish. Uh, a lot of persecution. And so from what I understand, our situation, uh, it was incredibly difficult to get the uh, visa to come over here. Um, it took a few years. Um, I'm not really exactly sure how long they applied, but it was not an easy process, and there definitely was a lot of screening from what I understand. Okay. And how, how many years was that? Three, two plus years? Um, I'm, I can't tell you exactly the okay. details. Um, All right. This was back in 95, though, so the situation may have changed since then. Okay. There was another person in the audience here, Bugs, and on that side over there. Okay, this gentleman over here in the row 1234. My name is Vladimir. Thank you for sharing that story. My name is Vladimir Arutunov. Uh, I'm a refugee also from a former uh, Soviet Republic. Uh, I was born in Tashkent, Uzbekistan, and uh, uh, my family uh, came to the United States in 1993, um, fleeing uh, persecution uh, for being Jewish. Uh, and uh, it, I have heard, I was a, only a baby at the time, um, but I've heard stories from my family since then about uh, how uh, difficult uh, and time-consuming and arduous it was to um, do every, every step of the application process and then uh, everything it took to become citizens eventually after, uh, uh, after arriving here. Thank you. One, one more person. Sorry, one more person at the back. There was a lady. Yeah. Hi, my name is Sarah. Um, I, I do have family members that are refugees. Um, my background, just to give a little introduction about myself, um, I'm half Syrian, half Mexican. I believe I embody the American spirit. Um, I'm a delegate as well, so I'm really trying to, you know, focus on pushing, pushing for American values. And going back about uh, my family members being refugees, they were not given admission um, on the first uh, Muslim ban. Um, they were refused. Uh, to come here, um, so that was very hard on my family, but, you know, thankfully, because of a federal judge, they were able to come here, um, and if it wasn't for the law, they, I mean, they would have faced so much more difficulties, so that's my story. Thank you. I think so, it shows something. Sorry? So, can I say something about consistency yeah. now that we were talking okay. about that originally? Hassan, yeah, I'll, I'll let him respond. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. Him. yeah. So um, going back to the consistency conversation, um, there is one thing that the United States has consistently done, and that is to absolutely destroy every part of Middle Eastern culture in any way, shape, or form they can. But on top of that, but on top of that, hold on, hold on. Consistency. If we're going to talk about consistency, you talk, you want to, hey, let's look at the Muslim ban, right? Originally, when they first wrote the Muslim ban, there was supposed to be a 90-day trial period for the Muslim ban, and these are Donald Trump's words, until we figure out what's going on, folks. That's what he said. And then months later, when the Muslim ban was uh, turned over by the federal judge, when the Supreme Court actually decided to put the Muslim ban in action, that was already, there, months have gone by without any sort of problem solving. So is the Muslim ban really looking to eliminate some sort of um, problem within radical refugees that might come here that we treat as though they are just skittles in a bowl and not real humans that are actually uh, being oppressed every day in their countries, partially because of the U.S.'s efforts as foreign policy, and then they still look to America as this, this beam of light, this hope that they want to come here and have a better life for themselves, and then we deny access to them. What is the what are we trying to solve with the Muslim ban, really, aside from just putting up forward some form of legislation that is strictly intolerant okay. and divisive here, and to fear monger the it. debate? So, uh, so Adam? Yeah. What that show, you bringing out three people in the audience, I think, shows that we can actually, back to my consistency argument, we can actually use this to learn. For example, yes. we're in California, right? Anybody here from the central part of California, Stockton area? 
Okay, Laotian, Vietnamese, Sacramento, 50,000 Ukrainians. We have refugees in large portions, in large communities, Afghanis in, in the South Bay area, that are already here just in California. Get rid of the rest of the country for right now. Just talk about California. We can go and find out what worked, what didn't work, what threats exist, what threats didn't exist. But we don't do that. We don't. NGOs do, but the government doesn't do it. And I think that's where the, one of the other parts of this whole issue is we've got to figure out a consistent plan or consistent way to, to, to deal with refugees are not going to go away. Once this Syrian situation is done, 10 years from now it's going to be someplace else. So, Dr. Ale, you had this point about um, the, the, the expectations of refugees once they get to the United States. Can you address, like, what are the requirements, the benchmarks that they have to do? Sure. Sure, just generally, it's not that they come here and they're given, you know, handouts, uh, literally. It's, um, they have to repay their ticket, first and foremost. Within 90 days, they're required to have work. They have all these certain benchmarks they have to meet to meet all of their benefits. And within six months, the cash assistant is cut and you're facing the barriers of resettling your children in a new school, learning the language, reacclimating. If you are a surgeon, you're going to be a cab driver now. You know, you, you have the opportunity to work, but you don't get to translate all of your skills necessarily, the loss of all your family members, the trauma. So it is a very complex, impacted system. I've been on the other side as well when having them come here. We call it protracted, meaning they're in refugee camps five plus years. So the uncertainty from arriving to actually in-country is very complicated and very difficult. Yet, I, I'm happy to report this is an incredibly resilient population that wants to work, that wants to integrate, that wants to have everything that we have, life for their families, to move forward, to thrive, to succeed. And so, just in a nutshell, their process is quite complex. You can go to your, say, your local resettlement agency, Catholic charities, volunteer, tutor some of the kids. They always struggle with math and English, and parents are learning if they are not fluent in English as of yet. And you get to learn about your resettlement process. See, so, oh, wait, one second. There are a lot of actually churches um, that, that uh, partner with the U.S. government in resettling refugees. So um, for the good Christians out there, there's a lot of volunteer opportunities. Bassem, and then... I, I, just want, I, um, I just want to address the elephant in the room. We're not talking about refugees here. We're not talking about compassion. We're talking about Muslims. At the end of the day, it is people who are afraid of Muslims, all right? People could... But no, well, 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 say, 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 well, that's I, the I, problem, I, I, right? I really need that's to speak. the problem, your all right, blankets. So, Sarah, uh... if somebody is following Islam, that makes him a Muslim, so you cannot really, dis <laughs> you can, you cannot really separate them. So listen, sir, 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 give me, give me a chance. I'll, I'll, I'll make you hear whatever you want. Give me a chance. So the thing is... Uh, you, sir, said that like, why there is not one person that says what Muslim can do. That actually occurs in Iran. The Ayatollah, there is one person, everybody. Will, and I don't think that you want that example. And 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 the, and the thing is, so there's the thing is, when you talk, the idea is getting all those guys together. The Ayatollah, sir, there are people, there are people in Europe, and there are people in different parts of the world who condemn what happened of the radicalization of Islam every single day. Not every single day, but like, like. Usually, like, very, 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 very common. But the thing is, the thing is, sir, um, we already have agreed with you that there is a problem. Now, we want to solve that problem. Solving the problem of radicalization, of reformation. Reformation comes from within religion. The reformation of the Christian faith came from within religion. You do not need, like, a, a kind of a Martin Luther coming from outside to tell you what to do. There are people who are within the faith who are trying to do that. And they are being resisted by the authorities, Absolutely. by the, the religious authorities, and, I, by, I, and by political authorities. So it's not like we're, try, we're trying. We're not try, we are trying, and the problem is we are facing these very strong authorities. Mostly it's a political. The problem with Islam is not more of a radicalization. The problem with the Muslim world is a problem of free speech and secularism. When you have free speech and people can speak what they want, you will have a market of ideas a market, a market of ideas that can counteract these radical ideas. Now, my problem, now, I, I don't think like me and Hassan can give you the vibe that we are some of like uber Muslims who are pretty much like defending the faith. We are not defending the faith. We are defending people. We are worried about people. And the problem is, again, that discrimination does not discriminate. 
because there are people who have been victims of hate crimes. There are not even Muslims, not Arabs, and not Middle Eastern. There are Indians, there are Jewish Arabs, there are Christian Arabs okay. who are being like, uh, um, discriminated against. So again, sir, the problem of Islam is the problem of any other religion. People who would change their faith are people at the end of the day, and these people need your help. And you're not helping when we say, let's block them out. And, 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 one more, and one more thing, one more thing, one more thing because really, what I really love about American values is the idea of individuality. Everybody is his own individual. So when you come and tell me, no, sir, it's not most of the country who think that about Muslims, I agree with you. There are some people, but I, I, that's it's why I, 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 many of them, but when I meet you, I will meet, I will actually take your word as an individual. I will deal with you as an individual. Right. And this is what I am asking of you guys. Deal with anybody, Muslim, non-Muslim, Christian, as an individual. This is a core American value. Deal with them as individuals, not as a group, not as a follower of a certain faith. Thank you, Thank you. Appreciate that. Robert. Robert and then. Again, again. again. Again, we have to go talking back. talking about protecting this back. country. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. I didn't hear you. Robert. You can go ahead. Oh, my bad. My mic's up. Yeah. Yeah, again, we have, and, and I respect and, and agree with what you've said. I, I have to go back to, uh, you made the thing about the Ayatollah. Of course, th th you would say that. Uh, the idea of it is, is to get the leaders involved, get more of the leaders and leadership of Islamic faith involved, the communities. I've heard where they've had can I ask you something? And this is, a, this is an honest question. Do you believe Sharia is compatible with the U.S. Constitution? That's a big question. <laughs> may, 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 I, may I answer that? May uh, I answer that? Yes, may but I, I want that? to respond may to answer, your answer. answer. So Short the answer. Sharia that we see right now in the mainstream Islam? No, it is not actually compatible with life. Okay. But, the, but the thing is, but the thing is, sir, That's but the thing is, Sharia is like any other, anything else, you can actually have multiple interpretation with it. The main interpretation, the main interpretation, the main interpretation that is actually controlling the mainstream Islam right now is actually controlled by the Wahhabism and what, controlled by the radical Saudi narrative. Yes. Yeah. Take that this, out this because it, it's Sharia and the Quran was there in the 50s and the 60s. It's the same people. Right, so and we me, didn't hear about people like blowing the stuff up. Let me follow up okay. a second. <laughs> Again, so... Okay. So since you agreed one, with that, Robert, Sharia is not compatible with ahead. the Constitution. Sorry. Sorry, I can't since you it. agree that Sharia is not, forms the, the, of Sharia yeah, the, is not compatible with the U.S. Constitution. As a matter of fact, I will actually up that, and I said, like, even in my own Arabic countries, in Egypt and in the Arab countries, I have called that there should not be no mention of Sharia in the Constitution, that because we need secular exactly. Constitution. And this is what we are fighting for. Sharia, like Islamic Sharia should be dealt with like Jewish Sharia or whatever Sharia it is that should only control your own personal life, not a life of right. a group. But or there people. are elements. There are elements. And there are but elements in the Jewish that faith okay. that people have actually had bypassed and have evolved. Abroad. If Khalas you read the Bible, but right you, now can, they're you, not, you well, can kill your wife if she doesn't have sex okay, with you and obey you. There are a million different excuses. Okay. And people don't do right, that anymore. Right, stop, stop, pause. Please, let's go. Let's, Adam, it's yours. No, because, no I, think, I, think, I think they're on to something again, but I, but I want to just kind of turn it around a little bit in the sense that I agree, if anything's going to happen, you and I have to work together. You, you and they, you have to work together. We all, I mean, if we're going to change the world in general, whether it be Islam or whether it be just Americans opening their hearts to everybody else, we're going to have to work together and talk. You and I as well, whatever. The only thing I will say on the other stretch, stretch around is what you were saying a moment ago, kind of don't assume that so many people are against you. I know because they may have voted for Trump or not voted for Trump, because I meet people all the time that actually, you know, for whatever reason, love Hillary Clinton or love Donald Trump. Now, I have opinion about that, but the point is, just because they were one way or the other does not mean they believe that all Muslims bad or all, all Jewish people are bad or all whatever. So we have to get that past the point that automatically you guys assume, I say you guys because you put yourself together when you said both of you together, that you assume... <laughs> That, uh, that everybody, that there, there aren't a lot of people out there that do get it. I mean, I get it like you because I'm not Muslim, but I, I also do get, listen, we're going to have to, I've been, in, I've been in Israel, and this is the thing I told my wife, and I'll pass it on, I'm done for a while because I've talked too much, but I'll tell you this, was one of the coolest things I ever, my first trip to Israel was, we have a Palestinian producer and we have an Israeli producer, because in Israel, you can't cross over. Um, it, it's a long story, I can tell you after the thing's over with. Point is, 
I went to both, I happened to go to back-to-back -back parties. They were the same age, both female. One party one day, one party the next day. It was like my argument about Pakistan on the last panel. They are so similar in so many ways. Going to a Palestinian party and an Israeli party. I sat there as an American going, holy crap, I'm expecting this like, why, you know, one's pink, one's green. I mean, no. They were, they, I, if I brought them both up here, most, unless you were from the Middle East, most Americans could not tell you which one was which. We have better food. You do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Hassan. What you're talking about, okay. I, I, love, I love the example yeah, you're Mike, talking about yeah, because Mike. it's very similar. I love the example of what you're talking about because it's very similar to what you even see within uh, Greeks and Turks, right? True. And the thing is, very true. Um, Bassam is constantly talking about the individual, and I want to talk about the system a little bit because the same people that actually supported Donald Trump for his isolationist policies. The fact that he mentioned that the war in Iraq was terrible and we shouldn't have done it and how he railed against it. Now he railed against Hillary Clinton for being against the war in Iraq. Now those same supporters still are very much vocally in favor of increasing the, uh, the drone bombing that we're doing and, and the sanctions that we're putting forward on Iran, like trying to escalate tensions in the Middle East to potentially start more ground warfare. That is a terrifying thought because I think that it exacerbates the problem because when you have individuals that are struggling to come here and then we're vilifying them and we think that they're, some of them might be radicals so we should deny them entry and then on top of that they go back to the same uh, and then their, their homes are ravaged by war. There's no infrastructure left in these countries. I mean, how can you not expect them to be radicalized? I'm saying it's awful that so it's should, happening. Should it's terrifying. Should ISIS create a caliphate all over the world? No, absolutely. Well, by the way, that, you just advocated for a singular force, and ISIS is literally trying to do that with a caliphate. That's terrifying. That's Sarah, what we're no, trying no, to I tell you. <laughs> like, Sarah, Sarah, no, don't put words. I didn't say singular force. The caliphate. No, Sarah, I said get all the sex, get all the leaders, Arabic Muslim leaders, in a room, in a conference like this. Let them fight it out and say, you actually know what? Have, we don't have. agree with this. Sir, actually, okay. they have. Can I tell you one thing? Wait, 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 Forget what Sir, Abraham Lincoln said about freeing the slaves. You have to look That's, at you have to look at how religion is used in the Middle East, even I by understand. people who do not pose as religious leaders. Because many of, especially my president Abdel Fattah al Sisi, uh, he would say he would actually use religion because if you today go against religion and try to think and question religion, tomorrow you will question his authority. So all of them. I mean, they will, they, they will not come in a, in a room and say, like, we are going to... These are actually the bad guys. These are the dictators. You really don't need their opinion. Now, and I want to I wanna just, like, one, one more thing. I want to address the, some of the gentlemen here who are calling uh, on the Sharia and how Muslims are horrible. And I, I, I would like to address your fears. Now, for many Muslims, Sharia for them is just inheritance, eating halal, and, like, how to marry. For many... They actually use Sharia as a way to kill infidels. Now, the same Sharia, it's a, it's a, it's a 1,400 years old religion. The same people, the same Sharia were there in the 50s and the 60s and 40s. I, and, I, and I know that you have read stuff about Sharia. And many of the stuff that you have read is absolutely true. It's horrific. But it's not what is written in the scripture. It's how you use it and how you interpret it. Because if you look actually at the sheikhs in the Egypt in 1940, the sheikhs, which are like the priests, their wives and their daughters were not even wearing hijab. So did religion change or was it corrupted? So the thing is, we are talking, now we are here on the same side. Many of the people or the Sharia wanted to kill the infidels, want to kill me and people like Hassan. We are not their friends, all right? But I want to tell you that do not let this kind of interpretation that tells you that this what defines people. It can define a mainstream interpretation, which we are fighting, but it does not define people. Okay. No, sorry. Time up. Okay. I'm going to have the last word here. So it was very hard to actually get, get away from the issue of Islam uh, since we were talking about radicalism. 
and a lot of perception is that all Muslims are radicals, and we have a booth here at 32, and the amount of questions that we were had to address with uh, folks with, you know, make, make America great again in, your, in my face on, on all the issues. But was, what was really shocking, and we get these emails all the time, that I have to address all of you, and this is on social media, and I'm going to take advantage of this, is that if you perpetuate the same radical shit as the radical Muslims and promote their theology as truth, then you are just as complicit. Yes. 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 So, I, representing Muslims for progressive values, we fight the radicals. We are fighting all on human rights issues that are justified in the name of so-called God's law, Sharia law, which is totally a 100% man-made construct. So don't fool yourself unless that's what you want to do. You want to fool yourself. You want to fool your constitu constituency to hate Muslims. And what Bassam alluded to is really true. There really is a problem of hate towards Muslims. In some form, it is almost justified, but it is not unjustifiable if you're going to be just blankly hating people just for the sake of labels, especially when there's no basis, especially when we are Muslims are fighting the same fights. So get over it. We're on the same page. We're fighting the same BS. We're fighting the same radicalism. We're fighting the same four human rights issues. So just, you know, stop glorifying yourself and stop, <laughs> stop. seriously, you're just... I, I think there's a part of a misinterpretation there, what, what they're talking about. One second. I, I think what, what people want to see, and I'm, I'm looking at it objectively, I'm not a newscaster, I'm just an actor, a singer. I, I'm looking at it as a human being, as a guy looking at the tea leaves in, in America and around the world, and been around the world. What the West wants to see are you and you, and you, and you, and the rest of you here that are Muslim and, or Islamic have a, you know, and you're going to laugh at this, but I haven't seen the Million Man March to Washington, D.C., denouncing, denouncing radicalization. I have, no, no, but why do you, why do you want to minimize that? Sure. Sure. All right, no, no. There has been marches in London and in Berlin. I mean, how many more marches okay, can people so, do? There right. have been marches in Baghdad. There no. have been marches everywhere. The thing okay. is, Sarah, can I no. say something? Most of the fight that we're having with our people is in Arabic. That's right. All right? That's why you don't hear about it. Okay. All right? All right. All right. Well, well we're hearing about it today. This is right. what we need to know. Okay. Yes. This yeah. is what we need to know from the Arab yeah, community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sir, sir, All right, so we have to wrap it up. So wait, no, one, one second, because this is a very common thing. It's like, why don't we hear more about what we do? We do, sir. I swear to you, we do. We are trying to fight that. We try that. We, we, there is a lot of conferences out there. There is a lot of marches out there. There are a lot of... Because we... I'm telling you, I had a whole, like, hashtag called secularism <laughs> like that and by the way secularism for many uber muslims is like as synonymous as saying an infidels yes, an but we're right. fighting that but you didn't hear about it because it's in arabic because most of the population in the middle east speaks arabic right. because okay. i'm not going to speak to them in english the thing goes like why don't people get together conferences do not solve anything you go and you 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 you, uh, you go and you fight with them and you talk to them. It's not about like all right. You can you can have. By the way, that conference in Saudi Arabia where Trump went in Saudi Arabia, where they have opened a center called Atidal, which meaning um, being in the middle or uh, or moderate. That was sponsored by Saudi Arabia to counteract radical ideas. Okay, so on the last word. I mean, it is ridiculous. Basim, last word. I got it. So the hypocrisy of American policy, foreign policy, for me as a progressive Muslim, representing Muslims for progressive values, that's the problem. So if you really want to counter radicalism, you got to talk to your representatives and cut this BS of being allies with Saudi Arabia. Thank you. He was so in love